Hello, I would like to welcome everyone to the IBM Watson Health Executive Webinar Series. Today's presentation is titled Patient Engagement to Promote Population Health Management, presented by Judy Murphy, Chief Nursing Officer at IBM Global Healthcare. Before we begin, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. First, you have a control panel on the right hand of your screen. You can minimize and expand this panel by clicking on the arrow in the upper right corner. Second, you can submit questions using the question panel located near the bottom of your screen. We will try to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. If your question was not answered, we will respond to you individually after the event. Next, all registrants will receive a copy of the presentation and a link to the recording within 48 hours after the webinar. The information will be sent to the email in which you registered for. I also wanted to point out that we're featuring three videos during today's presentation. When we show these videos, you will briefly see the webinar title slide during the transition from the handout to the video. Next, I'd like to introduce Ms. Judy Murphy. Judy is the Chief Nursing Officer for IBM Global Healthcare, where she helps put together health IT solutions for providers in order to improve health and healthcare and lower costs. She is a fellow in the American, nursing, American Academy of Nursing, the American College of Medical Informatics, and HIMSS. She has received numerous awards, including the 2014 Don Eugene Detmer Award for Health Policy Contributions in Informatics, the HIMSS 2014 Federal Health IT Leadership Award, and the HIMSS 2006 Nursing Informatics Leadership Award. Today, Judy will cover how patient engagement is evolving with the changing healthcare landscape, new technologies, and the need for analytics. Judy, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much. That was a great introduction. Um, so if we can go to that first slide, uh, great, thank you. So what we're actually going to be uh, covering, this is just a quick outline of everything that I'm uh, going to be going through. Uh, first talking briefly about the uh, evolving healthcare landscape, like what's really changing and why do we as um, providers uh, need to, to change as well. And then talk a bit about pop health management, um, how pop health management is, is augmented or assisted with um, mobile. Uh, talk a bit about uh, population health management's uh, piece requiring patient engagement and why that's so important. Uh, talk a bit about uh, consumerism and, and e-commerce. Um, and then kind of wrapping up talking about uh, why we really need to position ourselves to think about analytics and cognitive. Um, computing. Uh, so I am really excited to be able to share this, this content with you this morning um, or this afternoon, depending on where you are <laughs> in the country. And um, I really do look forward to your questions at the, at the end. And so uh, if you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to put them into the uh, chat window, type them in, and uh, we will have uh, a good 10 minutes, if not 15 minutes at the end, to be able to uh, handle those questions. So on the next slide, I start this idea of talking about what's really changing in, in healthcare. And this is not going to surprise any of you. I've just sort of summarized it into uh, two slides, actually. Um, the first here is um, there's been a lot of shifts in expectations of our consumers, in expectations of um, the services that we provide. Um, so increased focus on, on quality and value and outcomes. Um, there's been actually an escalating incidence and, and, and cost of chronic disease, which is really causing us to have to look at how we manage that, uh, both within the healthcare organization and then, of course, outside of the healthcare organization in um, the expanding continuum of care, in other words, um, taking place in the home and in the community. Um, we do have changing demographics and lifestyles. There's certainly a globalization of healthcare. Uh, we do have some resource shortages, we've got competition, and um, not to forget we have huge advances in, in technologies and treatments that are also helping us really contribute to what we need to think about using and doing um, in this, this changing landscape. So on the next slide, I really summarized what I refer to as old healthcare and, and new healthcare. And of course, we're moving from the left side to the right side here. Um, and I won't read these all to you, but to, to summarize, we're going away from fee-for-service and volume-based payments 
to paying for performance and, and value. And of course, there's a continuum there. We're talking um, everything from shared uh, services and payments or bundled payments um, and, and certainly quality outcome-based uh, payments. Um, and the other thing about the old health care is that it was very transactional. It was, uh, in many cases, data poor and, and uh, disconnected, if you will. And that's really what's starting to change. Um, you know, you, you'd have to be, uh, like, sleeping to not know that interactivity has been at the forefront of discussion over the last couple of years, actually. Um, it was mentioned I, I worked for the Office of the National Coordinator for a while, and, and certainly interoperability was one of the things that I spent a fair amount of time on. Um, because whether you're talking about you know, uh, accountable care organizations, ACOs, or whether you're talking about the, your own ambulatory space and your acute care space and your visiting uh, or home care service um, space, this need to share information and share data and make sure that we're thinking about a patient-centric kind of record becomes extremely important. Um, and last but not least on this slide, what I really wanted to point out was this idea that we're, we're migrating toward really personalized and optimized care. Um, so there's still the concept of best practice that we've all always known. Um, but in addition to thinking about standards-based practice or, or best practice, um, evidence-based practice, if you will, there's this increasing concept of personalization within that. And that personalization could be personal preferences, things that I ask about or think about as an individual. Um, it might be if I'm an elderly person and you know I'm, I uh, have to worry about uh, walking with a walker and you know the number of handicapped spots in a parking lot, I may worry a lot about parking, for example. Um, whereas other individuals might care not at all about parking, but they would care about um, the service hours. You know, can I get Saturday appointments? Can I get evening appointments? Um, because I have a, the type of job where I can't take off of that. So again, this personalization has to do with my preferences. It also has to do with the idea of personalized medicine, of course, or precision medicine. Um, you know, the concept that um, we're able to target very specifically now um, our abilities to tailor make interventions for individuals based on their genomic or proteomic makeup. Um, and then, of course, everything in between there. Um, and so this, to me, is a really important concept as we think about where we're going from and what we're going um, to. So on the next slide, it sort of summarizes, and, and this is one of those, those graphics that um, you, know, you kind of look at and you go, whoa, there's a lot of information on there. But the most important thing about this slide is that it is person-centric again, and that everything related to data and information and the systems that are used need to revolve around that individual. And of course, in this case, I have the individual and the family, right? And so whether we're talking about the first circle around the family, which includes things like the social worker and primary care and the case manager and the therapist and home care and transportation housing. So all of those um, both healthcare oriented things, but also the social determinants of, of health, like where I live and what's my access to different kinds of um, uh, foods, uh, where I shop, you know, what kind of water I'm able to get. Um, all that becomes really important in that next circle outside the, the inner circle. Um, and that's also where we bring in the individualization. That's also where we bring in the um, evidence-based standards and things. So again, although this is a pretty busy diagram, I think it points out where we want to move to, um, that we are going to be focused on value and coordinating care around the individual and making sure that we're integrated into our communities. So I'll be talking about this multiple times um, throughout this presentation. But the idea is that help is not outside of my everyday life. You know, I don't carry on my life, and then I go and I do health care, and then I come back to my everyday life, and then five weeks later I go and do health care, and then I come back. The concept really is that we're integrating the concepts of health and health care into our everyday lives. 
And so whether that be the kind of activity we do, whether that's the type of, again, foods we eat, um, how we look at managing our chronic disease, um, how often we see our primary care physician for um, preventive things or for um, uh, issues that we might have. You know, all that is what I'm talking about, and we wrap that into how we actually think about our, our lives. Uh, and again, it's within ourselves as compared to it being this completely separate kind of activity. And so the new model uh, demonstrated on the next slide is really this idea of value-based care. And you've certainly been hearing that a lot. Um, Secretary uh, Sylvia Burwell of HHS um, went on record actually two years ago um, saying that Medicare and Medicaid payments would be 50% based on value by uh, the year 2018. That's 50% value-based payments by 2018, which, you know, <clears throat> in terms of the government is rocket, you know, standards. Um, being able to do something that quickly, um, you know, announcing it and getting something done in, in three to four years is actually quite, um, quite ambitious. And so we'll see. Um, they've certainly, um, in terms of Medicare and Medicaid, made some really big advancements. They've had all sorts of programs, you know, really focused on this. And as we all well know, uh, where the government goes, so goes private uh, pay insurance. Um, and so I think we're going to see a dramatic change over these next two years around this concept of value-based payments. And I, I like to center that uh, down to a very simple formula here, and, and that's what's on the screen. You know, this value, if you will, that the journey that we're all on um, to improve value is really made up of two components, experience and cost. And the experience um, has to do with both the results or the outcomes um, that we achieve as well as um, satisfaction. So are we having a quality experience? Are we getting quality outcomes? Um, and of course, the simple way of, of measuring that is through our, our HCAPS survey and our Press Ganey survey. But this is really going beyond that. And I'll be threading that into um, some additional um, discussion items as we talk here. Um, but this idea of satisfaction is not just around the traditional, you know, I'll call them process metrics that we use, um, but it's actually going to be um, much deeper ingrained because although today patients don't um, differentiate uh, care based on, on quality, um, they often differentiate on the cleanliness of their room, on the physical facility, um, you know, how easy it was to get an appointment, um, those types of things. Um, the idea of quality has increasingly been creeping into this satisfaction factor. And of course, the publication of quality scores for different facilities and different individual providers has been increasing over time as well. So I think our, um, our patients, our consumers, are going to be getting more and more savvy in this space and are not just going to you know, do things based on word of mouth or what their friend told them or how good a physical plant actually looks, but instead be beginning to focus on does this physician get good outcomes? Um, does this facility have good outcomes? Um, do they do a lot of this procedure so they've gotten really good at it? Um, and, and so again, I think the meshing, if you will, of what we would have traditionally called satisfaction and what we've traditionally called um, quality metrics are going to begin um, to mesh. And then, of course, in the cost factor, you know, um, the ability to actually understand what your costs are within a particular product line or a service and making sure that within that you're reducing waste, reducing errors, you're managing risk, you're improving efficiency and, and quality. And so um, this idea, again, is extremely important as we think about the, the value chain, right, and our ability to think about things like, um, are we efficient in doing this because we're using the, the uh, least expensive equipment or we have the shortest length of stay or we do a lot of our procedure prep before the actual acute hospitalization and we have minimized the acute hospitalization down to something um, shorter so that we can actually get the same quality and the same from our, our patients 
um, but it's costing us a lot less to do it. Um, that's, of course, where readmissions comes in, which is something that we're really focused on um, right now. So this becomes, I think, a really interesting equation um, that back of many of our minds, um, how do we create value? And it's making sure that the cost is low and the experience is high. Um, and so this is, I think, a real interesting or, or easy way to really um, think about how this uh, is focused. So now we're going to get to a little bit more complicated slide on the next slide because this is where population health management actually ends up coming in. Um, because as we think about creating that value, we want to make sure that we understand our population and that using personalization and individualization um, as well as group um, statistics that we understand where everybody actually is and we tap into them no matter what segment that they're actually in. So let me explain this, this graphic a little bit. Um, I believe, personally, that this is probably the way we're going to be looking at organizing health and health care you know, going forward. I know traditionally when we say the words pop health management, we right away think of reporting or we right away think of um, you know, running reports and understanding our, our percent of diabetics and then understanding within that percent of diabetics what percent of them are getting hemoglobin A1Cs every year and which ones are getting foot checks twice a year, and those types of um, process kinds of metrics. And that's all in, embedded in here, but I really like to think about it more writ large, where we think about meeting people where they are and trying to keep them on this graphic as far to the left as we can. So let's kind of go through that. So the entire population is broken up percentage-wise there uh, in terms of about 40 to 60 percent of us, you know, depending on the area of the country and depending on, you know, um, the living conditions and things, are in what we would call that healthier, low-risk population. Um, this set of the population has a relatively low health care cost probably don't need a lot of engagement. Um, sometimes when we talk about engagement, we do actually focus on this group because we want to keep them there. You know, we want to um, have health apps, activity apps, diet management apps, um, where we're keeping them as healthy and low risk as, as we can. So keeping whatever percent is in that group um, in that, that group. And their outreach doesn't necessarily have to be super um, personalized, right? It can be fully automated. And, uh, you know, we want to track and monitor the, these people, but it's probably, again, fairly low touch. As we move to the next quadrant, that 20 to 25 percent of the patients that are at risk, um, I've identified there that one of the at-risk populations is, is the 60 uh, and above. But it could be numerous other things. So it could be things like a family history of high blood pressure, a family history of diabetes. It could be um, a person who's overweight. It could be a person who is borderline high blood pressure. Um, so these are people that are not yet um, demonstrating chronic disease, but they are at risk of developing chronic disease based on familial conditions, based on living conditions. Um, based on their heredity um, and those types of things. So again, um, this particular group, uh, we want to keep at this level, or if we can, even move them into the farther left, the healthy low risk. So for example, we can't change heredity and, and family history, but we could change things like dietary habits and obesity, right? And so keeping a person who, who uh, or getting a person who might have been overweight into more of a, a normal range would pull them out of this quadrant and into the healthier low risk quadrant. And that would be, you know, certainly desirable. So there's some group here that we can try to start to move over to that left hand side. Um, the cost here in terms of overall healthcare costs um, goes up. It's a 15 to 20 percent of healthcare costs. The engagement here can be can be low touch, um, but it does, of course, depend on the individual. And some people might do really well with active intervention, right? With reminders, with apps that they use on their mobile phone um, to track their activity, for example. So this is the area uh, where some of our, our uh, activity trackers like Fitbit might come most in. For somebody that we're really trying to move back into that, that left-hand side, um, getting them more active uh, might actually be helping them. 
And so again, typically the engagement is low touch. And again, the outreach might probably be able to be mostly automated using emails or calls or texts, and, and as I've already mentioned, mobile apps. As we move into the third quadrant, um, we uh, have a smaller or dwindling amount of the population, 5 to 15 percent of the population. Um, it does have chronic disease. Now, again, I mentioned uh, a couple of slides ago that you know there is an increasing incidence of some of our chronic disease. So, um, diabetes, for example, high blood pressure, for example, we are seeing an increasing incidence of this. And so, this particular um, group becomes extremely important to try to, um, if they have the chronic disease, manage it well so that complications don't develop but also to try potentially to move them back out of this if it can be done. And again, it certainly can't be done with all conditions. But sometimes well management, uh, good management of a disease can actually push you back into the at-risk population instead of the actual onset of the chronic disease itself. And, and certainly adult onset diabetes is one of those where we might be able to make an impact. You see that our costs go up to 30 to 40 percent. Um, here we're requiring engagement more of a medium to high touch um, so that diabetic, for example, very clearly we want to make sure that they understand um, what conditions they, uh, um, not conditions they need to manage, excuse me, um, what activities they should be managing, what appointments they should be making, what lab work should be done. You know, it's much more prescriptive in terms of the activities um, that need to be done through the engagement and the outreach. And you can see there again that the outreach would be uh, blended, um, that we could do, you know, uh, retail outlet uh, care management, and it, it pretty much could be automated. But they are going to require some high touch, meaning appointments um, with primary care um, uh, providers. And last but not least, we have our 2 to 3 percent who have active disease. These would typically be our, our hospitalized patients. Um, you see the cost goes up exponential there. These, of course, require high-touch engagement and active case management. Um, now, the kind of distressing statistic about all of this is that on the far right-hand side, those two columns are about 20 percent of the population, but they drive about 80 percent of the cost in healthcare. And again, this is probably not a surprise to many of you. You know, there's there's also very equal uh, staggering statistics in terms of the percent of healthcare costs that are spent in the last year or two of life, right? And so there's um, this high concentration of money in this very small percentage, which is, of course, what drives up the cost for absolutely everybody. And so, getting control of those two right-hand columns and particularly the far right-hand column, makes a bunch of sense. But I also want to point out that you know, active management of the left-hand side also makes sense for all the reasons that I talked about before. But this is precisely what we are trying to do that's a pretty dramatic change from what we thought about in terms of healthcare before. When we talked about healthcare before, pretty much we probably talked about the two far right-hand columns. As we migrate forward and think about more of these integrated models and the continuum of care, we're taking health and health care and saying population health management requires looking at our entire population and managing the risk no matter which quadrant they seem to fall into. Um, now, last but not least on this slide, um, I have indicated some capability needs like what types of um, IT support you might be able to uh, provide or should be thinking about providing in each one of these rows, if you will, um, everything from analytics to uh, customer relationship and campaign management, mobile apps, again, as we talked about. Um, and so you can see some of the engagement and outreach techniques that might fall into those categories that we'll be talking a bit more as we um, continue. So the next thing that I wanted to, to talk about was very clearly the, the power of mobile. So on the next slide, um, I, I've actually pulled some antique slides that I have. So if you just hit enter twice, um, you see a very interesting um, computer on that far left there that telescoped down out of the ceiling. And what was interesting about this is that that was what we called mobile at the time. Um, this was in the early 1990s. 
Uh, Wi-Fi did not exist, so you still needed cables. And then both of these, even the cart on the right-hand side, you see the cable going up into the ceiling, because that was both electricity, because our batteries didn't work real well, and it was the cable for the network, because Wi-Fi didn't exist. You can also see we didn't have flat screens. And if you look at the bottom of the cart, you can see the big um, CPU base. But why this was so important was that as we looked at the workflow of healthcare, and of course this is in an acute care facility because that's pretty much where we had computing in the 90s. Um, we didn't take anything into the home because we didn't have anything portable or mobile. Um, so we were focused on acute care and even then as we thought about the way we deliver and think about patient care and, and healthcare writ large, we needed to think about the workflow and how the um, individual care providers um, interacted with the computers and the information in the computer. And so I'll contrast that if you hit enter one more time with the types of devices um, that we have available today. So we've got our smartphones, we've got our Apple Watches, and we can actually go anytime, anywhere with our information, with our care plans, with our reminders, with our alerts, um, with any of the things that we want to do as providers as well as apps that are going to be able to be used with our patients for some of those, those same purposes, right? To understand what they're supposed to remember, to understand what they're supposed to be tracking and you know, entering in. Um, and so it, it's just such a different world today that I, I want to draw everybody's attention to this because the tools we have at our disposal as we think about migrating from this more fixed transactional, siloed-based healthcare of the past to this more continuum-based um, across all venues of care, across all of our patients. Um, you know, our horizons are just broad in terms of, of what we can do. So the next slide talks about um, some of the things that mobile actually can do for us. It facilitates anytime, anywhere access to both data and services beyond, beyond the traditional settings. It helps us develop new engagement techniques and strategies to use with patients and consumers. And last but not least, when we're collecting more information through the use of mobile apps, we have this ability to pull all of that data and gain additional insights so that we can provide more personalized proactive interventions and actually take analytics and not have it be about reporting and, and what we do um, retrospectively, but have it be about concurrent um, analytics that can be driven directly to the, the point of care. So on the next slide, we're going to attempt our first video. It's a very short video. I want to uh, thank Kaiser Permanente because it's one that they have out there demonstrating the art of the possible. Um, so let's run the video if we can get it to work. Judy, you might need to mute your line uh, during the video. It's a heads up. All right, thank you. Thank you. Are you still there? We are. We might be having some audio difficulties. Okay, because I lost video as well, personally. I think we should just go back to the slides. It's not, not worth it. OK, what that video was was um, a really great video. And you will get them uh, the, the links on the slides so you can look at it. It's like a minute and a half long. And it's, it's something that Kaiser put together that um, demonstrates this sort of anytime, anywhere access. It's a father with his child. He's shopping. He's looking for um, something that's going to work for a, um, a 
insect bite that this person, uh, his, his daughter has, he takes a picture of it. It, you know, it just does some, it's a little bit beyond what we actually have available today, but it helps us think about, you know, the art of the possible and imagining this idea of, of care anywhere. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to look at that video on your own once you get the slide deck and get that link. Okay, so let's move into really talking about why is it so important to engage patients um, in this idea. And I hope I did a good job of describing when we were going through pop health management why patient engagement was so important, right? Because again, it's not about the episodic encounters with the healthcare organization. It's actually about me thinking and taking care of myself and my health and my health across the continuum of care at all times, at all aspects of my life in, in, at different times. Um, and so um, this talks about what I think an individual is really looking for um, for them to get engaged in their own care. They want the healthcare um, organization that they partner with to know them, to know their history and their preferences. Um, they want the healthcare organization to help them get engaged through personal offerings. And then, of course, they want um, the healthcare organization that they partner with um, to empower them. So I, I like this slide because it helps you think about the, the different ways that folks might um, Think about their, their healthcare organization. And I want each of you to think about how important it is sometimes, like, I don't know, um, let's use Starbucks. I think that might be a good example. So Starbucks knows you, right, if you have one of their cards. Um, maybe you have their app. Um, you know, you can easily interact with them. You can even order ahead of time, right, and pick up right in the pickup line. Um, if you've got your, your credit card in the app and you've got everything organized, you, you know, it makes your experience um, tailored, it makes your experience streamlined, and it helps you specifically select how you want it to um, happen. This is really what we're talking about with patient engagement. So it's not just the healthcare providers kind of like cracking the door and saying, okay, consumer, I'm going to let you in. It's more than that. It's taking that door and opening it, opening it wide so that you can very clearly um, make sure that you're incorporating the um, likes and desires of the individual to that experience and that you're empowering them or you're activating them uh, to do what they need to do. Um, and not just, you know, inviting them in for select, you know, small, smaller kinds of, of components. So making sure that you're thinking about this as a healthcare organization, and not just in the little way, but really in, in the big way. Um, so right away we think um, oftentimes, well, I'm going to get patients engaged because I'm going to give them a portal. Well, you know, portals are good. You know, they're, of course, very helpful for an individual to be able to look at their care plan or to look at their lab data and see their results to maybe make an appointment. But it's a lot more than that. You know, it's not just, again, opening the door and letting them, you know, sneak a peek at some of the data that you have in your electronic health record. It's actually using their wants and desires for creating the care plan in the first place, actually partnering in their own care. So that's really what I'm trying to describe on, on this particular um, slide. And on the next slide, there's some trends that have really been supporting this. You know, um, certainly the way we pay for and deliver care is changing. And what I mean by that is more and more the individual is bearing the brunt of the cost of care, right? So when they choose to interact with the healthcare organization, they're probably paying a good chunk of that. Um, the statistic now a, a, is approximately 50% of us are um, on uh, high deductible plans, which basically means we're paying a fair amount out of pocket before some of the payments from our um, insurance actually kick in. Um, and so when that happens, when we're paying out of pocket, we care more. We pay more attention. So imagine if I could have a shop and buy experience for a with a particular provider. You know, my, my doctor told me I needed to have an, um, a chest x-ray 
and I've got six different places where I can go for that chest x-ray from the hospital that's two miles away to the clinic that's a half a mile away. And I want to understand the price difference so that I can select the, the right location. Um, wouldn't it be great if that provider had opened up not just a traditional portal, but they had a portal where I could shop and buy. I would actually be able to see the difference in the cost of the chest x-rays at the six different places where I could have it done, and I could pick the one that fits my personalized needs. Maybe I care most about the cost. Maybe the cost is, is least expensive at a particular location, but the parking is really bad, and I really care about the parking, like I said before. Or maybe this particular place that I can have at this clinic, this ambulatory, they're open until 8 o'clock at night, and so I can go at 7 o'clock at night and have the x-ray done. So it's not just shopping and buying on price. It's shopping and buying the way we typically buy things everywhere, right? And imagine, again, if I could layer on top of that um, the concept of um, reviews. You know, like maybe uh, similar to going on Amazon and buying things by looking at the reviews that other customers have made of that particular um, uh, purchase. Uh, maybe we could have some of the services that we get through healthcare um, reviewed by previous customers as well. So it's kind of exciting. Um, health IT adoption has definitely reached a tipping point. You know, we're we're almost completely implemented now in all of our ambulatory and acute care facilities with. Um, electronic health records. And so now that we've got that base of the electronic health record, we can start layering in on top of that some of these um, more complex, if you will, um, mobile applications or um, more deep, if you will, um, integrated uh, applications that we might want to look at. Uh, technology is getting better, cheaper, faster, certainly more ubiquitous. And of course, consumers are increasingly expecting online engagement just like they get in all other aspects of their lives. Um, so the next uh, slide is a video. And we're going to skip it because I believe we cannot get this totally figured out. Um, however, this one is really helpful because it brings up the issue is as um, data and um, applications become more ubiquitous, it might behoove us to really think about the safety and security of that. So this particular one is actually kind of a tongue-in-cheek um, video where um, somebody's calling in to order a pizza. And of course, the person who's taking their order knows all about them and, and knows that their doctor just put them on a certain kind of diet and knows that a credit card that they're trying to use is actually maxed out and offers them a special on a vegetarian pizza because of the diet they're supposed to be on and, and these types of things. So again, I would encourage you to look at that. Um, it's just really bringing up the concept of uh, IoT and how everything is eventually getting integrated and how we really do, alongside of that, need to remember always to think about the um, importance, if you will, of, of uh, the security of everything that we're doing and only sharing the information you know, that we, we should be sharing. OK, so as we go to the next slide, what's really driving this idea of consumerism? So I brought up this concept of shopping and buying, right? And so here's some background just in terms of, of thinking about um, the importance of the ability to have options. So um, the graphic on the right shows the growth of retail clinics, which is absolutely unbelievable over time. You know, in 2010, 2011, 2012, if we had an issue, we went to our doctor or we went to our emergency department. And maybe our emergency department had something that they dubbed kind of a quick care or, a, you know, a separate desk for um, non-life-threatening um, illnesses. You know, I, I was going in because I got a a bite or something or wanted a rash looked at. Um, but there was no, no real competition, if you will. But look at what's happening now in 2016. Uh, retail clinics are, are just burgeoning, right? We've got clinics everywhere which are giving patients options. Okay, so we have uh, um, cl retail clinics in grocery stores. We have them in Target. We have them in Walgreens and CVS and Rite Aid. Um, all of these have given people other places to go, especially when they're paying out of pocket, than just the traditional, um, you know, go see your doctor or go to your, your ED. 
And a couple of these things I've actually said already, um, out-of-pocket costs are increasing, high deductible plans are increasing, and there's certainly new business models for delivering care, um, providing uh, patients with, with more choice, if you will. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, um, this actually is another video, which we will also not try to run, um, but it is a demo of uh, health plan engagement uh, where there is, it is actually an IBM uh, created application, and uh, it was created for a payer um, so that individuals who uh, subscribe to that payer could shop and buy. Um, so they'd actually be able to... Um, you know, go in and see the different costs of things, see where different providers are geographically located, pick the one they want to go to, and those types of things. So actually um, fun to watch as well, and I would encourage you once you get the slides with the links um, to go ahead and look at that. So on the next slide, we're going to pivot now and talk about um, analytics and why analytics becomes so important and it's a foundational or core strategy as we really think about um, everything that we need to do in, in healthcare. And this particular slide kind of segments um, the, the analytics into, into four different columns. We've got sort of the traditional population health column. Um, we've got our provider relations, understanding our referral patterns and, you know, um, what are we learning by all the different um, individuals and where they're interacting with our organization. Um, risk management, and again, I talked how important it was to understand your supply chain, understand your value chain, what are your costs under particular sets of diagnosis, et cetera. And then last but not least on the far right-hand side, um, really understanding consumer engagement. So I think this is a really good model as you think about um, approaching analytics. You know, across the bottom are examples of the types of applications that you might actually have in the different categories. Um, but for me, it's thinking about making sure that you're managing the data in each one of these, these columns, if you will. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and these, I think, are... are um, very all very important to an organization if they're going to manage their patients correctly and still continue to be um, successful financially and successful from a recruitment and retention in terms of both patients and and providers so then if we go to the next slide you know as we talk about analytics there's of course a journey um, and many of you have probably seen this slide before because IBM has been using it for a very long time and it's um, going from what would be considered the the very basic reporting on the left hand side to the much more uh, complicated reporting as we go to the cognitive and not even reporting it because it's more cognitive analytics and uh, what we think about as we don't program the logic anymore but allow the machine learning to occur on the far right hand side. Um, so as we think about this, whether you're a client or whether you're a um, uh, person that actually maybe works in the IT department and are helping on this analytics journey, how important it is to continue the movement, um, not just at the basic reporting, but also moving into foundational and the predictive and, and prescriptive. So for example, um, when we think about uh, readmission rates, it's going to be important to understand not just from a basic reporting standpoint what patients are getting readmitted, but it's more important in foundation to start to understand why they're being readmitted. And then, of course, as we move into predictive and prescriptive, actually understanding predictively which patients are going to be candidates for readmission so that you can actively intervene before they get readmitted. So that might mean the education or the training that takes place before they're discharged. It might also be supporting them in their home um, once they've actually um, landed there, if you will, and um, you're going to help them with the things that they're supposed to be remembering to do once they're, they're in the home. So let's go to the next slide and, and talk briefly about, and, and again, I'm going fairly fast on the analytics slides because the purpose of this was not to talk about analytics, um, but if we've got any questions, we can certainly handle those in the, in the Q&A section that we're, we're just uh, three or four slides away from here. Um, 
again, strategies here need to span both knowledge-based methods and data-driven methods. So knowledge-driven are really the type that we might traditionally think of as we originally talked about with Watson, and that is um, Watson's ability to read through published articles and periodicals and book chapters and understand what that um, uh, published knowledge is actually uh, saying, uh, synthesizing it, and being able to revise, if you will, or identify evidence-based best practice. And I'll contrast that with data-driven methods where we pull in the electronic health record data. Okay, This is where we're actually pulling in individual data to give individual patient care and individual insights, and where we can also do some patient similarity analytics. Both sides are very important as we talk about pop health management because we want to continue on the left-hand side to be aware of newly published literature of which no individual can keep up with, right? But we also want to understand what that means for the care of individual patients. And so, for example, in um, uh, an individual patient, for example, not just what are the best new treatments for the cancer that they have, but what cancer treatment would best be appropriate for them as an individual. And that's what the right-hand side is, is really saying. And on the next few slides, just a couple of you know, graphics that represent you know, the, the progression, again, of having um, cognitive computing and what's all required to do that, you know, starting with the platform and building the dashboards that report the information right on through that ability to actually predict um, what's going to be happening, doing that natural language processing that's available through uh, a cognitive computer or um, you know, a product like Watson, doing the patient similarity analytics to understand that there appears to be, for example, something new that wasn't built into the um, data that we were already had in our literature, that we're seeing something new going on with our patients. And that's that machine learning part that's really engaged in the cognitive computing. And so on the next slide, um, just to bring into your consciousness, because everybody always says, where does cognitive computing fit? You know, um, it fits in that it's the third type of, the third era of computing. You know, we started with tabulating back in the uh, early part of the 1900s. We moved into programmable. Pretty much programmable is where most of us sit today. Um, our electronic health records, for example, are programmed. Any condition that you expect the electronic health record to um, act on or to do something about has to be programmed. So we have to account for the condition and we have to tell the computer what to do. That's programmable. In cognitive, again, it's machine learning where the machine itself can draw some of these similarities and make the inferences and make the recommendations. And increasingly, we're going to hear more and more about cognitive, not just with IBM and Watson. I'm sure there will be some uh, additional competitive um, products. And on my last slide, the importance of cognitive cannot be, as we talk about patient engagement, as we talk about um, population health management, you know, this ability of a cognitive computer to learn and reason and to interact naturally through the natural language processing so it can actually understand words on a printed page or it can understand words that are audibly um, said, um, this is going to dramatically change. So some of these products that, you know, the Amazon Echo, for example, um, Siri, you know, how we're increasingly interacting in more of a normal way um, and then the new discoveries and the ability to, to create decisions and to offer recommendations is a really, really, really um, big deal. So with that, I'm going to close out the presentation and open for questions on the next slide. Um, I don't know if there's been anything typed into the chat box, but I will um, go back to my organizers and say we've got about 10 minutes left for, for Q&A. At this time, you can submit questions using the question panel located near the bottom of the control panel. We will take time to answer as many questions as we can. We will take a minute for the questions to come through in the queue. And Judy, the first question is, obviously all patients are different, 
but what advice do you have for engaging with patients in a way that works best for them? Yeah, so I, I think at the most basic level, we need to find out how they want to interact with us. And so, um, you know, my mother, um, she just turned 90, by the way, we had a big birthday party this last weekend, and she doesn't have a smartphone, and even if she did, I don't think she'd use it for texting. Um, and so for her to interact with the healthcare organization using text wouldn't make sense, okay? So the next question is, how would she want to get reminders or alerts or those kinds of things? She does do email once a day, usually it's like around supper time, and of course she has a phone. Um, so would she prefer to get an email, which is kind of asynchronous, or would she prefer to get a phone call, which of course would be more synchronous? And we need to ask. And then once we know an individual's preference, we would actually log that in our system so that that's how we would continue to act, interact with that individual. Okay? And so if um, she happens to have high blood pressure and diabetes, so if there were going to be reminders that were sent out, um, again, she would be getting them one way. I would never want the phone call, right, with the, the synchronous or even with the voicemail message being left. I would, personally, I would probably pick text. Um, and so, again, understanding what the individuals, even at that highest level, uh, interaction point, how they, they prefer to interact. Great. Um, the next question is, what are your thoughts on how practices can begin to transition to these more cognitive and technology-based patient engagement strategies? Oh, that's, that's a really good question. So, um, you know, I think the idea is as we become what I like to think of as a learning health organization, we can do a better job of uh, taking what we learn through cognitive computing and iterating it back into our practice. So when I use that term learning health organization, um, what, I, what I'm specifically referencing is that um, as we learn things about an individual, so um, let's just say we're interacting with an individual and we find out that they are always going to a particular place of our website and they're always looking up some, some of the same information. Um, what if we would then create a push personalized to that individual of the information that we know that they like to look at. You know, a very simple way that all of us interact like this is, you know, when we order online, right? So you order something online and now, <clears throat> whether it's Google or uh, some other system on your individual, for me it happens to be Google, so when I log into Gmail, what does you know, Google do. It brings forth other things that are like the thing that it knows that I ordered yesterday, right? It's personalizing uh, to, through a push to me, um, things that I might want to be considering or things I might want to be thinking about. So just imagine once we knew that about individuals, what tapped into their individual um, desires around whether it's eating or whether it's um, you know taking their medications or looking up information on a disease or a clinical trial. What if we turned around and we were able to put similar things to that or pushes when things related to that were updated and how much value that might have to an individual and how that individual not only would be more likely than to act on those things, but also say, wow, you know, this health organization has really got it together. It's sending me things that I care about, right? So it creates a stickiness with the healthcare organization as well. So that's one small example, <coughs> excuse me, of how we can take you know, personalization of, of, of cognitive and drive it back into an individual experience. But you could take that same example and imagine how you could do it uh, on a broader scale across multiple patients so that you could think about how you were changing your programs. You know, you might have a particular class, for example, online uh, materials that nobody ever looks at, right? Now that's not super big cognitive, that might actually be more of a foundational basic report, but the idea is to actually use that information to learn from it and iterate it back into what you're offering or how you're changing, um, you know, a plan of care. Maybe you find out that a particular therapy really does seem to be working well, you know. Um, for nursing, for example, since I'm a nurse, you know, we struggle a lot with patient falls. You know, maybe um, through cognitive computing, you can find out the inferences and the, um, the correlations that have to do with those things that 
happen when there is a fall versus that happen, you know, that, that prevent the fall. Because um, we struggle with this a lot. No matter how much research we have, we're not planning what causes falls, right? And so imagine if we could use cognitive computing to advance our research and knowledge in that space. So that's, I think, another really good example. Great. The next question is, there's also a range of capabilities of our healthcare workforce to using and explaining to patients how to use these technologies. How do you envision or transition or prepare our workforce for these changes? Oh, gosh, another really good question. You know, um, you're, you're absolutely right. In fact, um, well, first of all, it, it dawns on me when you were asking that question that I spent a lot of time talking about patient engagement, and what I didn't talk about was provider enablement, which is what I like to think of. You know, a, a provider doesn't magically know all this stuff, and whether that provider is a doctor, a nurse, a therapist, a case manager, you know, they need to be educated as well in this changing healthcare landscape, whether it's the technology of using that mobile app or whether it's the technology of fully understanding what's on the portal um, or how to integrate, you know, personalization into the way you approach care. We need to enable our workforce as well. And, and so whether that's providing them with information when the patient's in front of them, or whether that education, you know, outside of, of the patient um, uh, engage, the patient situation, the patient um, interaction, um, both probably are really important because, again, we can support them during the interaction with the patient by pushing things to the provider. That's going to be good reminders as well. Uh, but we also have to educate them. Yeah, we don't magically all understand all the apps and how people can integrate them into their lives. Um, what I do know, though, and is that this isn't going to happen without the workforce being completely engaged as well. Um, you know, healthcare workers, particularly nurses, are extremely trusted um, by the, the population at large. And so as we think about enabling and implementing these kinds of additional strategies to help people with their own health and health care, it's going to come from the healthcare workforce. Um, we're going to be introducing it to them. Um, I mean, just look at the strides that we've made in things like advanced directives once we started paying attention to it, or flu um, vaccinations. You know, um, I think as a workforce, once we start paying attention to helping people see how they need to manage their own health, I think we'll see, you know, great strides. But we have to educate the workforce as well. Yeah. Great, Judy. Thanks. Um, that's the end of our Q&A today. If we did not answer your questions, we will uh, be in touch after the presentation. Um, I'd like to thank Judy for her time today. As a reminder, you will receive a follow-up email that includes this presentation and a link to the recording within two business days. Um, we ask that you use our feedback on today's presentation by taking a brief survey when you log off the webinar. The next slide has Judy's contact information if you have any further questions. And then also, um, we hope that you'll join us on September 14th for the next IBM Watson Health Executive Webinar which is featuring Amy Yearwood of Huntsville Hospital, who will be speaking on quality incentive programs. The registration link will be provided in these handouts and also in your email. At this time, the webcast has ended, and I thank you for attending and hope you have a wonderful day.